Hello everyone. I was asked by Chung An Sunim to talk about whatever I feel is uh, uh, relevant. And uh, I don't know how he does it, but uh, he knew probably that I have no stage fright and I love talking about myself. Um, especially I like to talk to people about uh, my life and uh, people that are interested on how it came to be, what I do, and how I do it in hopes to inspire others and hear their story and maybe get inspired by them and get motivated by them to continue my spiritual path as it is. So I'll tell you a bit about myself and how it came to be that I, Ron, is here with you right now doing the Kyonche for three months. So uh, I was born in 78, I'm 41, I'm going to be 42 in a few weeks. Um, and uh, I live in Israel, in Tel Aviv. Um, I, I'm married, I don't have kids, I have a cat and a lot of other cats that we foster and uh, we give a home until we find another place for them. When I was uh, little, um, I lived in the USA for a few years. That's why I got the non, not Israeli, but not really American accent. Um, and it stuck. I wanted to be a musician most of my life. I uh, played many, many instruments. I uh, learned sound, I learned music, uh, but somehow computers kind of got in and uh, shoved its way in, and that's what I did as a career. Um, when I was 18, I did military service like every uh, Israeli, like most of Israelis. Uh, that was three years that I was in an anti-aircraft missiles. It's like these shoulder missiles that you shoot at airplanes, but no airplane came. So I basically just had it on my back for three years and it was much taller than me. And it was really, really inconvenient and I hated the whole experience. But I, I, I was different after that, uh, the military experience, because when you're a kid, you uh, choose your social circle, you choose your friends. But when you're in the army, they stick you with people that you would never choose as your friends. And then something happens. And I realized um, being with a lot of people that um, I didn't know that everybody's insecure. So my insecurity, I was very afraid to expose myself. I was very afraid to to talk even. But after uh, the military service, I couldn't shut up. I uh, got a lot of confidence. A lot of people for until I was 30 even said that I have too much confidence and I'm kind of a jerk. Um, but uh, I just had a good time and I did whatever I wanted. I had a good life. When I was 33, um, I met uh, Gila. She is my companion in Israel. We live, we live together, um, except for the cats. Uh, about eight years ago, we decided to be vegan. Um, I love watching uh, YouTube videos and lectures. I just put something on while I was working and it just caught me. I was like, like this for an hour, just looking at the lecture and something there really spoke to me. Um, and I came back that day. I said, Gila, I, I want to show you something. And that day we made the switch out of the ideal that we just don't want to hurt other beings. It doesn't matter if it's human or if it's animal. And uh, that was a big change for me because that was the first time I think that the compassion inside me was got like front stage. And I wasn't afraid to do it, even though most people around me didn't know why I was doing it or didn't understand it. Luckily, Tel Aviv, the place I, work in, I, I live in, is... Uh, now like a very big vegan place and you can eat wherever you want and you always have hummus which is uh, vegan anyway so it's not a big deal um, but I always had a very good life I was always successful I worked uh, uh, I had a 15 year uh, career uh, in programming I worked uh, in companies and on projects as a web developer um, I worked in the um, Tel Aviv uh, tech scene and uh, eventually got into big companies and did big things that uh, did a lot of things in the world. Um, I won't get into that. But um, 
in one of the business trips that I had, I was in Amsterdam. In the business trips, I could uh, just tell them where I want uh, to have the layover, and then I would there be there for like two days. I just went to uh, the hotel room. I uh, smoked a joint. I put on uh, a video, something that my brother sent me, and he said, maybe this will speak to you. And it's, it was a video called Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds, something about spirituality. And until that day, spirituality for me was, uh, it looked pathetic to me. It looked like something that um, people who don't know how to cope with the world um, invented for themselves, something imaginary. And um, I just didn't want to hear anything about it. So I put on the video, and the video starts with a scientific approach about the universe, about the Big Bang Theory, about uh, uh, dark matter, um, about uh, fractals, about uh, cymatics. That kind of lured me in. That like really spoke to me. So it was a few minutes in, and I was, uh, I was still there. I was still attentive. And then it um, transitioned to a still frame of a Buddha statue. And it just, it freezes on that. And then the narrator says, when the mind is perfectly still, the illusion is understood because it is the mind itself that drives the illusion. And then there's like a bell, and I was looking at it and I had to pause the video and take a step back. Something there spoke to me. It had nothing to do with logic that like the mind can't comprehend what that means. But something inside me told me, you're looking at the truth right now. And uh, I don't remember if I cried or if I laughed, but I, know, I knew at that moment that something uh, profound happened. And there's going to be a shift in my life. So that thing that I was always uh, laughing at is now going to be me. And if something so profound that I thought was not real is actually real, and there's something inside me that tells me that, then maybe I should take a step back of, of just thinking that I know anything in this world. So instead of judging something before I actually experience it, I decided that I'm letting everything in, and we'll see where it takes me. So that was when I was 39. That was about two and a half years ago. And... Um, one thing I always look at inside of me is my inner resistance to things. It's almost everything I do has resistance in it. And I've always had uh, the ability to talk to myself, to have internal conversations and understand the path and trace back why I'm doing what I'm doing. But now I want it to go even deeper to understand my desires, to understand my emotions, to understand my anger, to understand everything that I'm doing. And knowing that I made such a big mistake, now I'm looking at everything with a microscope. The first thing I did was food. <laughs> when, uh, when I was growing up, food was uh, something I was really staying away from. Uh, I would eat, but I would eat only what my mother gave me. So new food, new experiences with food, something that was unfamiliar, I would just shove away. It was it really kind of made my childhood crummy because uh, socially it uh, made things very messy. Uh, and I grew up with a lot of insecurity about that. Um, but knowing that this resistance made no sense, a friend of mine told me, I have a surprise for you. Close your eyes and open your mouth. And the first thing I wanted to do is just say no, but I saw that automatic response and I said, okay, that's automatic, so let, let, let's just let it happen. I opened my mouth, she put something in it, I gave a bite and it was so tasty. It was just a fig that I have never tasted before. Since then, food has opened up to me, like it's things that are basic, like avocado that I didn't eat, a mango. Now I know that I don't like papaya at all. Before I didn't like it, but now I know that it's gross to me, only after I put it in my mouth. So that's basically how I try to go in life. Just say yes, and then I'll make a decision, and just let things go in. So um, the first thing I did is I quit my job. 
Um, and me and my wife just went to India. I told them like eight months before, I'm going for a long time. So uh, find someone uh, uh, to do that thing I do uh, for me. We went to India. We didn't have a plan. We just went like anywhere uh, that, uh, that we wanted. And we stumbled upon an enlightened being. He has no name. I don't know his name, just Bhagavan. And we stayed there for a few months, just uh, doing retreats such as ashram, very small. Maybe a Sangha is just uh, 15 people. I don't know what it is today. It's not even on the map. And that was the first time we saw someone who actually gave us a teaching and not YouTube videos. Um, when we came back to Tel Aviv, then we couldn't go back to the life that we knew that was false. We had to make a lot of changes for us to keep our meditative life. So uh, we really minimize our resource usage, everything that has to do with um, um, how much we waste, how much we buy. Um, do we really not need all the stuff that we have? We sold a lot of stuff just to have some income so we don't have to work. Uh, we got rid of a lot of things. We gave away a lot of things just to be lighter. Um, I used to eat six meals a day just to be over 60 kilograms or else people tell me that I look too thin. I gave that up. It doesn't matter anymore. I don't really care. Uh, the hair, I mean, I, I just, uh, I, I listened to Sad Guru on YouTube and he said, and someone asked him, why do gurus have long hair and a beard? And he said, we don't do anything. You're the one who cuts it. So I just stopped. And I know I look like a terrorist hobo Jesus, but <laughs> that's fine. It's okay. It's only in my mind anyway. Nobody really cares except for me. In my mind, I have so many conversations about what's good and what's bad, but I have this life now and I can use it. I have my companion, and when I told her about the video that I saw, she was like, I already knew this stuff, and I was afraid to tell you because I thought that you wouldn't accept it. So that day, we just uh, started living a spiritual life together, and everybody goes his own way. And we, you know, people ask me, is she okay that you're going for three months and not talking? Yeah, she is. And when she does it, I give her her space, and it's amazing. Um, I started growing vegetables. I do carpentry. Um, I did go back to, uh, to work, but as a freelancer, I work from home. I work as much as I want, and it's enough to work uh, just a few months a year for now. I don't know what's going to happen next year, and it works for us. Uh, and uh, how did this come to be? So Shai Misestrano, he, he was here in the Kyolche two years ago. Uh, when he came back from the Kyolche, and I knew him from the field, uh, he wanted to hear what I do in my company when I work there. Uh, maybe it's an opportunity for him to do some good. And then he told me about the Kyolche and said, maybe it's something that I can recommend to you because it's really a life changer. And I told him, that's extreme, man. That's never going to do that. All the chanting and the bowing and the, nah, it's too much. But... I realized that I was, again, resisting immediately to something that I don't even know. So I put it aside. That was 2018. In 2019, I started working a bit, and uh, my wife took on uh, studies. So I asked myself, okay, what's my next step? I guess I need to do this. I uh, am on Messenger. I went on the Facebook page of the temple. Someone, maybe Dukesunim, wrote back and, uh, and said, you have to go through Tamir Masas. Uh, some of you know him. Uh, he has a Zen center in, uh, in Etsiona, uh, not, not in Tel Aviv, unfortunately. Uh, I have to go there for two and a half hours by bus. But I go to him to prepare for the Kyolche. He said, in two weeks, that was in September, we go here, we have a three-day weekend. Maybe come with us and see if it's for you. So I came here. I fell in love with Dokesunim and uh, Estelle and um, felt really good here. It wasn't easy. It was difficult, of course, for me. But something about the sensible living of the temple, everything makes so much sense to me. And um, maybe, maybe that's uh, how I'll give you a little story for the end. 
uh, in one of the business trips that I was, uh, it was in Hong Kong, and that place was fascinating. I would go in the streets and I would look at the buildings, at, at the alleys, and one thing I noticed is that there were dead animals everywhere, like especially sea animals. They dry them, they hang them, they make a powder out of them, and you can smell it everywhere and you can see it everywhere. I don't mind it too much. That's their thing. It's okay. But I was looking at a vegan restaurant, and when I arrived at it, I saw there was like an apartment that served food, just lunch, a vegan lunch for whoever wants. And I looked at the menu and I just broke down. I started crying. Something about the craziness of what I experienced outside. I just had so much relief because something about that vegan place made me think that I was in a place of sensible people and I'm not alone and uh, it made me feel like this is the place I want to be and that's kind of how I feel about the temple. Living in Tel Aviv, living in modern society, hearing negativity all day long, hearing people go with their mind not understanding what they're doing, being protective, trying to force and manipulate each other. I see it all the time. And it's hard. And when I come here, you people are so different. And I feel that there's something common in all of us. And I want to thank you. Thank you.